Hey there, welcome to Takeaway with Sam Okus, a podcast from Nations Restaurant News. I am Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief of NRN. This is the show where I give you an all-access pass to the restaurant industry's most influential decision makers. This week, I'm talking with Nathaniel Rue. He is the co-founder and chief brand officer of Sweetgreen. Of course, Sweetgreen has been one of the most influential fast casuals out there since it first opened in Washington, D.C. in 2007. And it's been a first mover, particularly in restaurant technology, helping to pave the way for countless other fast casuals that have adapted very tech forward approaches to their operations. Now Sweetgreen is innovating with its new loyalty program, SweetPass, which it just rolled out to customers. SweetPass is available both as a free version and as a subscription-based premium version. And Nathaniel joined the podcast to talk about Sweetgreen's efforts to retool their loyalty program and how the brand is continuing to, continuing to work ahead of the curve when it comes to technology innovation. In this conversation, you will learn more about why your loyal customers should be your focus group for brand evolution, how great brands can turn a simple transaction into an opportunity to build community, and why points-based loyalty programs are out while subscription-based programs are in. By the way, if you enjoy this conversation with Nathaniel and you want to learn even more from him, he'll be joining us in Palm Springs this October for our Create Experience. It is a -a one-of-a-kind event for growth-minded restaurateurs, and it is completely free for restaurant professionals. Head to create.nrn.com to check out more uh, and to check out our ever-growing roster of incredible speakers, which includes Nathaniel and many more, and head there also to register. Jumping now into my interview with Nathaniel Rue, the co-founder and chief brand officer of Sweetgreen. Also, don't forget to stick around after the interview as I will share my seven takeaways from this conversation, actionable insights that you can take with you on the go. Okay, Nathaniel Rue, the co-founder of Sweetgreen. Nathaniel, uh, I don't think too many people on this planet don't know about Sweetgreen, but um, for those who are curious what you guys have been up to in the last now 16 years, I think you guys have been kicking around. Tell me about just the evolution of the brand and what Sweetgreen's up to in 2023. Yeah, first, thanks for ha- having me on the podcast. I've been a fan for a while, and um, I'm just like excited to get get in get in touch with you um so yeah yeah so sweet green is 16 years old um we started in college really with a shared mission of uh how do we think about making healthy food a little bit more accessible and and kind of more fun and at the time when we started sweet green uh we saw that the food companies a lot of times with the best marketing were the ones that were the most unhealthy and so we said mm-hmm. hey why can't we take that playbook or those same ideas and and use it for healthy food. And so for the last 16 years, our mission is to connect more people to real food, but do it in a way that I feel like is connected to culture, but also uh, makes it easier for people. And um, it's been an amazing journey. I have two other co-founders and uh, we still sit in the same office. We still make decisions together. And it's um, it's been an an amazing business, but also an amazing partnership. And um, Mm -hmm. Today, we have about almost 200 locations, about 6,000 team members uh, in the U.S., and uh, we really feel like even though the business is 16 years old and we're a little bit older now, um, we're still kind of still in the early days of what Sweetgreen can become. Yeah, and and by the way, to to start a company with your college buddies and not have killed each other yet after 16 (laughs) years, congratulations, good for you. Um, That's awesome that you guys are still so involved in the business. Uh, you know, I think you guys really were the first to, in my, in my impression of it, you guys really put that idea of the lifestyle brand that you guys were kind of first to market in the restaurant industry with that is how I feel like it it, it was. And you, you know, you had a music festival, you know, you guys were a, a vibe almost more than you were a product. I think that continues to be the case, but I'm curious to get your opinion on how you think this concept of lifestyle brand how has that aged? Because that meant something in 2007, meant something in 2012, meant something in 2017. What does it mean in 2023? 
It's a really great question. Something we ask ourselves all the time, and we um, we wanted to build Sweet Green for uh, essentially our generation of people, and and it really was just in the beginning marketing. We we actually had no idea how to do marketing. It was more what what do we want the, our community to kind of feel when they came to Sweet Green, and how do we find like essentially people's passion points and connect that to healthy food. So uh, as you mentioned, we, we threw a big music festival in DC for six years. And it was really just because we were passionate about music ourselves. And we wanted to find ways to take a, a little bit more of an untraditional path in building the brand. And at the time, you know, we, we still like, we actually, we, we didn't have a ton of mar money to spend on marketing. So we had to find a little bit more alternative ways through earned media experiences, uh, things like the festival to kind of tell our story. And I would say that um, in the beginning, it was, it was really just the three of us. I would say in 2007, it was just the three of us uh, introducing ourselves, working in the restaurants, uh, building community one person at a time. Uh, we would host these dinners at our apartment on Sundays with people in D.C. and friends that we met in the community and in our industry. We would go to the farmer's markets and just introduce ourselves and, and build that community and that's how we started. It was really just one person at a time uh, on the ground marketing um, and building that lifestyle brand. And then fast forward to kind of 20, call it 2012 to 2016 was really that moment where um, we invested more in music. And we had this kind of opportunity to throw a big music festival at Meriwether and uh, just outside D.C. and had some amazing headlining acts like The Weeknd and uh, The Strokes and Kendrick Lamar and it was our way of showing that you could still eat quinoa and see a great rock show at the same time. And, and finding, again, finding alternative ways just to tell our story. And then fast forward to, I would say, more recently, um, we've really started to take those ideas, whether it's music or food um, or art or, or sport, and try to partner with other individuals that are Sweet Green customers that can help us amplify our story. Mm -hmm. So we've recently got into... Um, a lot of kind of more finding athletes that represent the brand. So we worked with Naomi Osaka a few years ago, Devin Booker. Um, and we've also worked with a lot of chefs in the space who kind of um, give Sweet Green a little bit of culinary credibility when it comes to our food. And so we've been able to partner with people like David Chang and Dan Barber and Nancy Silverton and really just having a great network of chefs who still believe in our mission but we can collaborate on certain dishes that people may not be able to get because they can't go to the restaurants. So mm -hmm. it's this evolution of lifestyle brand for us was really just where do we, how do we show up where people's passions are, whether it is in music or food or art or, or sports, and, and then use that as a conversation starter to talk about healthy food. Sure. And, and that idea of lifestyle too, I mean, that was, <clears throat> you know, other brands outside of restaurants have emulated that as well. Something like Soul Cycle, something like uh, Lululemon. And, and it is very much a customer, you know, I am a sweet green customer. I am a Lululemon customer. I am, I go to Soul Cycle. You know, that, those were the brands that I think really was a matter of identity for customers. And, and I'm connecting this to loyalty because, I mean, essentially that is loyalty, right? I mean, by saying that thing, you're saying I am loyal to Sweet Green for my restaurant business or my salad business or whatever it might be. And that brings us to today where loyalty is such a huge part of the conversation. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about how Sweet Green has evolved your loyalty efforts. But what has loyalty meant, you know, beyond that concept of getting into the customer's lifestyle, more formally, more practically, what has loyalty looked like for Sweet Green over the years? Yeah, our um, our journey with loyalty started. I would say, um, I, I mean, even in the beginning, I think we had like a punch card style loyalty. It was a physical card. You you know buy ten get one free. And then in twenty twelve twenty thirteen, uh, we went on this journey to essentially create a new mobile app for ordering. And the vision for that was how do we almost have creative parity from what your the experience is in the restaurant to what you're seeing on the app. And so we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about how to show food photography differently, how to almost customize your salad with ingredient, ingredients visually versus traditionally at the time was radio buttons. 
And, and on top of that, um, we worked with a company called Level Up to build uh, a digital loyalty program that, again, was, it was like spend 99, get 9, but it was all integrated in the same mobile ordering experience. And so we launched that in 2013, um, and it was the same time we actually opened some of our restaurants in New York City. And so there was this kind of uh, big adoption, mass adoption of ordering online with Sweetgreen because uh, traditionally the lines were long at lunch. We have this new way of ordering Sweetgreen to get it, you know, pick up, um, and at the same time you could get rewards. So it was this kind of like perfect storm of where the industry was, the technology available to us, and using creativity and, and, and really great visuals to kind of tell that story. Um, and so that's kind of how our journey started with loyalty. So that gets us to today. Um, you're, you're taking another step forward in loyalty. Um, tell me about what that is and how you got to this point. Why, why is this the direction you're going with your loyalty program? Sure. So, so we've, we had that loyalty program 2013 really through uh, the first year of the pandemic. Um, so about, call it seven years. And what we realized is that the, the program that we had was great at the time, um, but we realized it wasn't necessarily incentivizing the right loyalty behavior. Uh, a lot of it was just pre pretty much discount driven. And um, what people got more excited about than just the discounts itself were the actual status tiers of getting from going from green to gold to black status and just the recognition there. And so we took a beat and we said, hey, why don't we almost start over? How do we think mm. about loyalty? And from a consumer standpoint, and in the middle of COVID, we decided essentially to sunset our, our current program. Um, and we actually have spent the last year and a half or so rebuilding it from scratch. And, mm. uh, and a big part of that process was actually just talking to our guests and talking to our customers. Um, I personally have spoken to a lot of customers. We've done a lot of surveys and intercepts, and we have something at Sweetgreen called Sweetgreen Insiders that is a, it's in a, a mix of some of our best customers who give us feedback. And we've spent the last 18 months really co-creating this loyalty program together with them. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, we're launching it uh, next month and really excited about it. And it's, it's kind of this combination of a two-tiered program where um, there is a free portion. Uh, it's called Sweet Pass. And then there's a paid portion, which is mm. Sweet Pass Plus. And in the Sweet Pass part, essentially what, what we heard from our customers was two things. One was they want to still earn free sweet green. And how do we give other ways to just do that based on their ordering behavior? So a little bit mm. more of a personalized approach to earning free sweet green. And the second thing we heard was they, they wanted access back to your original question around lifestyle. They wanted access to more lifestyle-oriented things, whether that be merch or access to exclusive dinners or events, and building the brand in a more kind of like culturally interesting way than just mm. with uh, free sweet green. And so what we've done is we've created something that we're calling challenges, which is uh, almost opt-in ways to earn free sweet green. Um, if we notice that you're an avid lunchtime user, but you've never come for a dinner, we'll, potentially we'll send you a, a dinner opportunity. Or, if, or if, it's this, if the launch of our seasonal bowls, if you eat, order three of our seasonal bowls, you get the fourth one free. And finding ways that are a little bit more dynamic and time-bound to mm. create a, a little bit more of gamification around our rewards and loyalty that's in the form of these challenges that people have to complete. Um, yeah. And at the same time, uh, we're launching our first ever merch store. It's called The Market, uh, okay. along with our Sweet Pass launch. And that's uh, essentially kind of like our first foray into like creating a lifestyle brand around clothing, objects, items for your home, things like that. And those will be um, exclusive first to Sweet Pass users. So it's mm. really building this ecosystem of, yes, there is a way, ways to earn free sweet green, but also ways to connect with the brand. Why, why is that sort of experiential component? Why do you think we've gotten here with loyalty programs? Because hearing this from other folks, just like that, it's not about the discount, it's about the experience. Why does that seem to be the direction consumers are going in? What are the limits of an experiential loyalty program? You know, we're, we're still learning what that is, to be honest. I think we're going we're gonna to learn as we go. But I, I do feel like there is 
certain brands that if you can figure out how to connect with your guests in a way that builds community, in a way that they're proud to wear your clothes, in a way that they're, you know, so much of our business is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, to your point, what, what Sweet Green is selling is, yes, we're selling a salad, but we're also selling this culture and vibe and lifestyle. And if we can find ways, even in, a, in an area that is predominantly pretty transactional with loyalty, how do we kind of find every opportunity to tell our brand story? And I think mm -hmm. that's the magic of, of great brands is how, how can you use moments of transaction and turn them into things that kind of go beyond that. Sure. Yeah. You guys, you've been so innovative for so long on the tech front of things. Um, you hear this a lot. Uh, this has been commonly said. A lot of people compare you to like, you guys are like a tech company that sell, sells salad because of how much investment you've put in tech innovation, uh, which is a compliment, I think, because of like how much you guys have done that. And so much of, of what you've done has come to pass um, across most of the industry. And I bring that up because... Obviously, with loyalty, innovation, digital innovation in particular, has been so key to what loyalty is today. I don't think, you know, without di mass digital ordering, without mass adoption of, of digital, uh, um, you know, mobile tools, we don't get to a point where we're doing experiential-based loyalty programs. Um, so how do you, as, as being first movers on a lot of technology in this industry, how do you try to take loyalty a step further? How do you try to innovate in this sector and do something very unique to Sweet Green that you, you really can't find anywhere else in the industry? Yeah, it's funny, uh, you know, you mentioned the tech company thing. I feel like we've always thought of ourselves as a food company first, tech company second, and we use mm -hmm. technology to enhance the customer experience. Um, I think there, I think what the world wants to, especially post COVID is more moments of connection and more mm -hmm. moments in person and and that's been our thesis is how do we how do we almost think about technology as invisible and really find ways to bring the narrative of the brand forward and the food forward um, and that's I don't know if it's a technology solution I think it's just more of a mindset change for us on on at speaker what we like you think about food, food is such a social and human experience. And it's a lot of times when you have your best conversations around a table and, and how do we think about technology almost enhancing that and being vis invisible to that, mm -hmm. but really having the food and, and community really be first and foremost. And, that, and that's why we were really excited when we were talking to our customers about what they were looking for in a loyalty program. And they mentioned and so many people had mentioned kind of like connection to the brand and finding more ways to think about these lifestyle moments. And so that's kind of why we over-index there. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm going to ask a stupid question, but I think it's going to help to kind of ground the conversation for a lot of people listening. Yeah. What is the value of a loyal customer? Because you think obviously a loyal customer is going to keep coming back. You're building repeat business. But... I imagine there's value beyond simply get them to come back into the restaurant more. What does Sweet Green see as being that value of the loyal customer? Well, I would say two things. One is <clears throat> as much as we've been able to partner with amazing people or have done these music festivals, have really promoted the brand, the way Sweet Green works is just through word of mouth. Really, like the number one, the number one way we get new customers or customer acquisition is simply just by great experience and ha somebody having an amazing experience, and that person telling five people, and that person telling five of their friends, and five of their friends. Yeah. And and I and I really believe that is the value of a loyal customer is somebody who is just such an evangelist that are willing to go out of their way to tell five of their friends about Sweet Green, because that's the best marketing or best seal of approval that we can get yeah. beyond running running a big advertising campaign and things like that. So I think num first and foremost is finding ways to deliver that 11 star experience in a way that it creates people that can just be your essentially your cheerleaders. Yeah. And and it's really st even to this day 16 years later, 200 restaurants, it's still just one person at a time. And I think sometimes brands that get bigger forget that and and we actually you know in covid we didn't we didn't have that opportunity to really kind of go back into the communities work with people in the restaurants introduce ourselves 
and that's what gets us really excited about this moment in time. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would say the second thing really is around just like overall frequency and and how you can almost use loyalty and certain menu items to kind of create a journey for customers. And what we find at Sweetgreen is most of our uh, new customers, they tend to order something that's off the menu or some one of our uh, signature salads or bowls and, and, and think about that as like a gateway product. And mm-hmm. then once they start getting comfortable, they'll remix that one, of, one or two things on their favorite item. Maybe it's a harvest bowl, but they sub something else out. Um, and then once they kind of become maybe say like a more advanced user, a more frequent user, they start from scratch and they feel confident in customizing their own bowls. And I think that's, that's the journey that we see and, and, and love people to get to because they feel like they have a lot more control and knowledge around the food that they're eating yeah. um, and, it, and it makes it more fun for them. So to that end, tell me about the data part of this, because you can see all of those things. You can see the customer making that decision that they went from playing it safe to experimenting a little bit. I guess from a data perspective, how do you use the data and how much do you want to know? Because, I mean, data in the restaurant industry today, there's infinite number of data points you can collect. But what what makes the most sense for you to collect and how do you act on that data? Yeah, our approach has always been a little bit of art and science. I think that the, some we've gotten to a place where we've used too much data and we've made the wrong decision. Mm. And the same is true of using not using data and making the wrong decision as well. And and where we find the balance is, I would like when we when we think about a campaign or a project or some type of new menu offering, um, or when we even think about loyalty, uh, we we have five essentially five different customer segments that we look at in terms of the way they behave psychographic studies a lot of that data plus we have a lot of ordering history but what kind of validates a lot of it is just talking to customers themselves and i think it's that it's it's that qualitative in-person kind of nuanced things that you hear from guests and it can be from guests that have had a great experience and and have not had a great experience and we try to find a combination of people that are our most frequent users and people that actually have come in and, and complained about Sweetgreen. Mm. And I think that's that's the real magic is having a foundation of really good information. Um, and in the restaurant industry, it's actually, it's not as easy as you think we to find the right type of data to, to kind of make decisions. And, and I, I really believe going back to food being kind of that human experience, it's really talking to people in person. And, and finding and going into the restaurants, talking to even our team members and our head coaches in our stores because they're the ones that actually have all the answers. Like I can right. go into the, my local sweet green around the corner and I could probably get a pretty good gauge on what's going on, what customers want, what they don't want, how they're reacting to it versus combing through and mining through a bunch of data to kind of figure that out. And I think right. it's just our approach of, of making sure that we look at both the art and the science of it. Because you, I mean, obviously menu innovation still being so key to the success of Sweetgreen, still focusing on salads and bowls that are tapping into trends, are looking really ahead of the trends. How much can some of this data help you with the menu innovation piece of it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, It helps us a lot. I feel like menu innovation, uh, it's, it's really, what we think about it is how do we solve uh, what our consumers are asking for, and and at Sweet Green, the number one thing they ask for is op- more heartier options, and mainly at dinner. And so that's a big mm. a big focus for us is how do we expand beyond just serving or being known for serving salads, and really ca- crossing the chasm into dinner and into kind of like more craveable items. And um, our, actually, our first foray really is uh, we launched something called the Chipotle Chicken Pepper Bowl. Um, which got some news, and um, <laughs> um, and it was essentially the campaign was not a salad, and it was mm-hmm. it, kind of like our lettuce list bowl, uh, kind of lime cilantro, black beans, chipotle dressing, uh, using a wild rice, uh, double portion of chicken, and finding ways to kind of show that healthy can be also comfort food. Sure. Hey, you picked a heck of a way to announce that new product. So I did. Nice job I did. That. <laughs> but not really allowed to talk about it in detail, but it, it was uh, it's definitely sure. something that was pretty wild. We all found it entertaining at the very least. <laughs> Appreciate um, it. 
Yeah. So, you know, thinking about, again, sort of the, the broader landscape of loyalty programs, I feel like it keeps coming up these days that, um, you know, loyalty programs in restaurants are going the way of the airlines. Everybody talks about status now and tiers and seems like everybody's trying to pull lessons from the airlines, what airlines have been doing for obviously many years. Um, can you compare and contrast, I guess, um, Sweet Pass, but also just loyalty programs in the restaurant industry in general? You know, how much is this a good thing that restaurants move toward this idea of status like the airlines do? And you know, maybe what are some some things to watch out for if we go that direction too far? Yeah, I I would say when we when we looked at building our loyalty program again, we took a look at both restaurant loyalty programs, airline programs, hotel programs, and I think what what we wanted to create was something a little bit different because it our our program isn't points based. Most of these programs, you, you know, you earn to get get points, use your points for certain things. And um, I think the, the what we found is the hard part over time is a lot of these companies they you start devaluing points because you make the things to get more expensive uh, or mm. cost more points. Mm -hmm. And we 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 opted to go f focus more and what we're calling just like dynamic offers that are kind of personalized to you. So it. You're not have to think about like how many points you're getting and then what you need to get in order to do that, um, and then devaluing those later on. Mm. Um, so that was kind of at least our approach. Um, but I think our industry is it, and Sweet Green is very different than going to go you know flying on, on a plane or go, staying at a hotel or even ordering a coffee. They're just the the use case is very different. Um, yeah. I would also say that we don't have all the answers either. Like we're we're launching this thing next month, and um, we're really excited about it. But it's definitely probably going to evolve, and we're going to learn a ton on on some of the early findings. and And we just we like the approach because it's not only a free program, but there's also this opportunity for people to subscribe to a membership, mm -hmm. and that's that Sweet Pass Plus I was talking about. And essentially, it's ten dollars a month, and you get three dollars off your order every day. And the idea there is to kind of incentivize the most frequent guests of, of Sweet Green, which essentially pays for itself after three visits. And that's the type, and that's the consumer we want to get to because we find that if you come to Sweet Green after, th you know, three times or more, you become a more frequent user and you become more connected to the brand. And so sure. it's this, it's this hybrid approach to how do we, you know, just get you as part of our community and and connected to the to brand, but then also offer you. Um, a bit more of a discount approach um, based on the membership fee. Yeah, I think the subscription trend is really interesting um, because on one hand, I feel like I'm part of the the generation of like, you know, I, 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 I've forgotten how many subscriptions I have. You know, it's like yeah. every single streaming service and every single whatever. But on the other hand, the reason I have them all is because of the inherent value to me and, and what they can provide me. But on the restaurant perspective, when you think about some of these subscription programs, you know, depending on the kind of program, it could be a real um, loss for the restaurant. I mean, you know, I, I guess the question I would have to you then is how do you figure out when you design a subscription program, how do you design it in such a way that it doesn't become a loss to Sweet Green, that it's not like, a million people sign up for Sweet Pass Plus and actually get more than three salads per month, and you're like, "Oh no!" Like, what's what's the chance you take there? How do you design it to make sure it's that right balance? I guess. No, it's a really good question. We so first, what we did is in early 2022, we actually launched a pilot of Sweet Pass Plus, mm. which we we're calling today, and it was the exact same mechanic of I think subscribe for ten bucks and get $3 off your order. And we found that um, we, we got a lot of interest in it. And we also found that there was a, a little bit more of a long tail win for Sweetgreen over time. Um, not in just that, you know, kind of, we, I think we tested it for a few months and, and there was, I don't know, like a lot of excitement around being part of a program, being a member of a community, and then also the kind of subsequent visits that you would get over time and just kind of re-engagement that we saw with a lot of our guests. Mm -hmm. And so based on those findings, um, we felt pretty confident about this first step. But I think to your point, it, you, we, we may have to evolve it over time if, if, it, if it becomes more of a loss leader than we think it could be. 
But, um, but I think for us, the, the real opportunity is having both, having both the free version and the paid version to kind of like have a bit more optionality on what we can offer and then kind of evolve it from there. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so thinking about the broader economy and, and where we are today as a restaurant industry, um, you know, it feels to me like the trend toward loyalty programs feels like this kind of nice buffer for restaurants in preparation for potential recession, certainly in weathering through inflation. Traffic has been really tough on the entire industry. Um, sales are generally up for most companies, and that's great, but, you know, traffic is down. Um, and that can't really sustain itself much longer. So loyalty feels like kind of one of these great buffers to, to help in that. Do, do you guys see loyalty as being something to help Sweetgreen in this economic moment? Uh, and, and I realize it's not like a short-term thing versus long-term thing, because obviously you guys see this as a long-term thing. But how much, I guess, does loyalty help you right now as we come out of pandemic and we you know try to get through whatever this economy is doing these days? Yeah, we think it's a it's a... A great tool for us, um, mm. and I, and it's been interesting not having loyalty uh, over the last year and a half, and understanding what the baseline is, and I think that's what we're, we're most excited to see is like what, what can this do for us um, over the next year and beyond. Um, again, I don't. I think it's it's hard because every business and every industry is different. I do think there is an overall tightening of the wallet that, you know, all of us are seeing in terms of inflation and things like that. And programs like Sweet Pass can help, really help with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think beyond that is it's really understanding and, and going back to that idea of listening to your customer, of going into the restaurants and seeing what's actually resonating with them in terms of, I would call it price value, um, in terms of their frequency, and and then creating program based on that. I don't know if Sweet Pass for us is going to solve all of that for us, but I do think it's a great tool for us to at least start the conversation and offer our guests an opportunity to earn free Sweet Green in a moment that things feel a little bit more expensive. Right. All right, Nathaniel. Last question for you. Um, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years, Sweet Green has. You guys have had a number of innovations. Um, you know, you guys are are doing drive through. Um, obviously, with uh, Sweet Pass and and um, you know digital innovations you guys have going, there's just a lot happening with this company that's once again really leading the way. I think on technology innovation, one eye on the future. What's next as you look at you know how you hope the Sweet Green story continues another 16 years and beyond? Where is your eye on innovation today? How do you guys continue to be that you know leader in innovation in the restaurant industry? Yeah, we are actually really focused on our food. And I feel like that is our biggest innovation focus over the next year or change is, is how we really become a bit more universally thought of for both lunch and dinner. And so that's mm -hmm. been, you'll see over the next year or so, uh, a lot of kind of new food moments and menu items that kind of represent a bit hardier of an offering a bit more variety of product um, and a bit more just kind of like craveability when it comes to uh, sweet green and, and I, as much as you know we we did start as a salad company and a lot of people still refer to us as a salad company which actually in a way in our in our mind is a good thing because it helped us as a singular category kind of define who we were yeah. um, I think as we look towards this next chapter it's really defining ourselves as a bit beyond that and um, and hitting different day parts. So that's what we're really excited about. Exciting to watch. Not everybody would think menu innovation as the very fascinating <laughs> innovation, but if you don't have a great, exciting menu, then what are we even doing? <laughs> that's right. It always starts with the food. That's right. Well, Nathaniel Rue, co-founder of Sweet Green, as always, appreciate talking to you, man. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Sam. That was my interview with Nathaniel Rue, the co-founder and chief brand officer of Sweetgreen. So what should you learn from this interview? Here are my seven takeaways. My first takeaway is that you should look beyond traditional marketing to tell your story. Sweetgreen has been around for 16 years now, and I think in those 16 years, they've really been um, one of the trendsetters in doing this. 
they have had so many different brand extensions that help to tell their story that uh, Nathaniel and I talked about throughout the conversation. One of them uh, that I love is the great example is the music festival they used to host in D.C. They had incredible headline artists. And, you know, that was just another music festival. It wasn't necessarily some way for Sweet Green to, um, you know, force their brand upon people or anything like that. They just wanted to have a music festival with their fans and uh, and provide that for D.C. And that's a cool way to, again, tell your story. It says something about Sweet Green when you see that they host a festival and when you see who is playing on that festival. But Sweet Green's done this in other ways. They've partnered with athletes, as Nathaniel talked about, uh, Naomi Osaka and Devin Booker as two examples. By partnering with them, with some uh, celebrity chefs, these are ways that they tell their story through those people. And like Nathaniel said, where the customers are, where they're spending their time and attention, that's where Sweet Green is going to tell their story. So think beyond traditional marketing campaigns when you want to get your brand out there. What are some other ways to either launch events, products, partnerships, whatever it is that helps to tell your story? My second takeaway is that your most loyal customers should be your focus group for your brand evolution. I really liked how Nathaniel talked about the fact that when it came to adapting their loyalty program and coming up with a new one, they went to their most loyal customers who they call their sweet green insiders. Uh, I think this is really important to, to remember that you have loyal customers uh, whether you have a loyalty program or not, you have big fans of your brand and they have a lot of thoughts about what you can do in the future. Tap into that, turn them into a focus group, listen to them and what they would do for your brand that can help you guide your innovation going forward. My third takeaway is that some of your guests want deeper access to your brand and a loyalty program can give it to them. So loyalty programs, yes, great for uh, bringing people in more frequently. Yes, they're good for collecting data on your customers. But importantly, they're also a way to, to draw those customers in deeper, that they want to be a part of your community, what you're creating. And uh, there's all kinds of things you can learn from SweetPass in how you can do that and how you can draw them deeper. You can create experiences for your customers as Sweet Green is doing with Sweet Pass. You can gamify it and make it more engaging. Sweet Green's also launching a merch store where they're offering exclusive access first to the loyalty members. All of these things, again, are new access points to your brand for your customers. And, and for some of those customers, that's what they're looking for. Some of your customers, yes, might just be looking for lunch, but some of them, they want to be a part of what you're doing. They want to be on Team Sweet Green, for example. And by having this loyalty program that gives them multiple touch points and ways to engage with the brand beyond simply come in more and uh, rack up some points, you're, you're drawing them deeper into what you're creating as a brand. My fourth takeaway is that great brands turn a simple transaction into an opportunity to build community. So again, some of your customers might just come in for a meal and that's all it is. But uh, as Nathaniel was talking about in our conversation, you know, so much of this business, restaurant business in particular, is about word of mouth and you have to build a community one customer at a time. For Sweet Green, as we talked about, you know, they're building what Nathaniel was saying is a culture, a vibe, a lifestyle. It's a community of people who all agree to kind of the same ideas. And that's what you want to build. You want to get them from, I just come in for lunch to, I'm part of this lifestyle. And that's what great brands can figure out how to do. There's a lot of lessons from Sweet Green, as well as many other restaurant brands out there, and how exactly you can do that. My fifth takeaway is that there's no tech solution for bringing your food forward. Uh, I, I like this because, you know, Sweet Green, I think, often gets lumped into this category of, oh, yeah, yeah, they're a tech brand that sells food, uh, which I brought up with Nathaniel. And he kind of laughed about because I don't think they like that reputation, kind of just a reputation you get when you are a first mover in technology, when you do so much innovation. You know, sometimes you get known for other things besides your main product. But they're trying to redirect that focus. They don't want to be known as a tech brand. They want to be known as a salad and bowl brand. And so, and, and what I like that Nathaniel said about that is he wants, they want the technology to be invisible. They want the technology to enhance the human experience that you have at Sweet Green. And that, you know, there's no tech solution again for your food. Technology cannot make your food taste better. You know, 
not yet anyway. Uh, you know, it can't really, um, you know, it can't put that food from the, from the, the plate into the customer's mouth. It can't make them crave, your customers crave your food. Sweetgreen is very focused on all those things now, bringing that food forward. And, and that's a human thing. That's a social thing. So again, technology can enhance all of that, but it cannot replace that. My sixth takeaway is that leveraging data to make brand decisions is both an art and a science. Data, when you think about numbers, you think science, math, right? And, and it is a lot of that. But what I appreciated about what Nathaniel talks about in this conversation is that you can't rely on numbers alone. And in fact, he said, you know, there were some instances where they did rely on numbers alone and, and they might have overdone it. They might have made some wrong decisions based purely on some of that data. Rather, there's nuance to it. There's there's more than what meets the eye when you look into the data. And a lot of that nuance you can't get without talking directly to your customers. So yes, collect data. Yes, learn uh, from the data about some of the directions you should take with your brand, but round it out with some of the conversations with your guests. As Nathaniel pointed out, that should be both your loyal guests and those guests who have complained about your brand, because you're going to learn a lot from them. You're going to learn a lot of that nuance uh, that really will help you make the smart decisions for your brand going forward. My seventh and final takeaway is that points-based loyalty programs are out and subscription-based programs are in. Maybe not a blanket statement, but I do think it's interesting. Uh, Nathaniel said, I think this is true. He said, you know, points-based programs devalue over time because, you know, eventually you start sort of upping the ante of what those points can get. You know, you're just, in the end, you're just asking customers to rack up more and more points just to get those discounts uh, and, and it devalues itself. Whereas a subscription-based program, you know, that's something that really can drive frequency. And again, like I was talking about earlier, pull the customer deeper into your brand. So Sweet, Sweet Pass's premium version uh, is, uh, you know, it's it's ten dollars per month for, um, you know, three visit. You get three dollars off uh, for your visits, and you know that pays for itself obviously uh, after three after three visits, right? So ten dollars off, you get three dollars off your bulls. Hopefully, I'm saying this right. I, as I say it out loud, it doesn't sound right, but ten dollars off per month. $3 off per visit, right? And and that pays for itself after three visits because again, $10 anyway, you can do the math. My point is this, um, it could be a loss leader for the brand. They're going to retool it as Nathaniel talked about over time. But what it does is it encourages you, yes, to come back, but also to be a part of the Sweet Green community. And subscriptions, we see them popping up all over the place now. Panera just launched a subscription program. There's others who are doing this. And I think it's really smart because again, it's giving that, ability to your most loyal customers to officially say, you know, I'm Team Sweetgreen, I'm Team Panera, or whoever it might be. Um, you know, think about how you can take your loyalty program to another level like Sweet Pass Plus is doing. How can you have a premium tier that is more subscription based that uh, can drive that frequency, but also tell your loyal customers, you know, you are a part of this community of what we are building here. Those are all my takeaways for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you listen to podcasts and leave your feedback. You can also email me at sam.okus at informa.com. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you next week.